So we've been looking at 1 Samuel, and in, in the first week we looked at, about the way that Israel wanted a king, but their motive, their timing, and their attitude was, was wrong. They were, they were not ready yet. Uh, then we, last week we looked at the way that they wanted a king, but God was more a- interested in a person after his heart. So we're going to kind of look this week, following up with that, and, and basically ask that question, what does that mean? What does it mean to, to be a person with, with a heart after God? We're going to pick up the story in 1 Samuel 17. Now, if you grew up in the church, like, <laughs> uh, you likely already know the story of David and Goliath. But a lot of us may not be familiar with it. So, you know, it's a story of, of this upcoming king who faces off against this, this giant of a man with nothing more than, than a sling and a rock. And uh, he takes this, this huge dude out. I mean, it's a classic thing. You hear it even referenced in pop culture. Uh, Really just a momentous kind of thing that happens. But there are some elements of the story that I actually want to focus on. And that picks up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. It says, The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Socha in Judah and camped between Socha and Azekah in Ephes Damon. Saul and uh, the men of Israel gathered uh, and camped in the valleys of Elah. Then they lined up in battle formations to face the Philistines. So all you really need to know about this uh, You don't have to know all the geography of the land, okay? Hill here, hill here, valley in the middle. The two armies are on the two hills with the valley in between. I mean, that's really all you you really need to know from this scene. Then they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. So they're getting ready to go to battle. And uh, the Philistines have this idea. They say, okay, let's not all go out here and be crazy and die, okay? How about this? We'll send out a warrior, and you'll send out a warrior. So this should be King Saul's time to shine. I mean, this dude's huge, remember? He was the cat's meow. He's a tall guy, taller than all of his fellow Israelites. So, hey, he is made for this challenge. And then Goliath is the guy that they're going to call. He's a Philistine. He's huge. He's just referred to as the Philistine in verse verse 10. Uh, This is the man. He's... (laughs) He's the biggest enemy they're going to face. And so that takes us to verse 10. It says, Then the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul, this is Saul's moment to shine here. This is what he's made for. When Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. What in the world? How did we get here? You remember last week and the week before, we were looking at the whole reason why Saul was taken and chosen as king, was because he was the perfect model of a king. What is going on here? You have big, strong Saul cowering. And it doesn't stop here. It's not like, oh, it was a moment of weakness. If you, as you go forward in the book, uh, 28 verse 5, for instance, says, When Saul saw the Philistines camped, he was afraid, and his heart pounded. This is a whole bunch of chapters in the, in the future. So this isn't like a one, one-off kind of thing. Well, in contrast to Saul's cowering, you have David, who's going to be the next king. He's not yet in the story, but he's going to be the next king. And he's referred to as a man with a heart after God. In verse 13, or chapter 13, it says, The Lord has found a man after his own heart. And then in, verse, in chapter 15, he said, Who is better than Saul? Some very powerful statements that he's that he made about David in contrast to Saul. But how on earth did Saul get here and... What was David going to do with his life that made him so esteemed to God? What victory was David going to win? What thing was David going to prove to God that he was worthy to be the next king? And throughout 1 Samuel, we see a lot of contrasts happening, right? So there's the contrast of Saul and Eli with Samuel and David. There's also a, a contrast between Samuel and Saul. I'm sorry, David and Saul. And so you have all these contrasts going on throughout the book. But we're just going to focus on a few of them and see if maybe we can answer this question, what was David going to do that made him so esteemed to God? We'll start off in chapter 9. There was a prominent man of Benjamin named Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphias, son of, of, of a Benjaminite. He had a son named Saul. So this guy's got lineage. He's got the family. An impressive young man. There was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than anyone else. So he's got the pedigree down, right? Saul seems like the perfect choice. Well, then we look look at David. This is what it says about David. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. 
You didn't have son of, son of, son of, son of, did you? Just that guy in, Be- in Bethlehem. Okay, all right. Because I had selected for myself a king from his sons. So Samuel gets there to look at the sons. He's got a lot of impressive sons. He looks at them one at, one at a time, and God says the exact same thing to about every single one of them. Not him, not him, not him. Until finally we get to David, and Samuel's like, I don't understand. God told me to get here to go here None of these people is the right people. And so, and, so the, and so David's dad says, well, there's this one other guy. You know, so. How would you like your dad to talk, to you, talk about you like that, huh? He's out in the field, though. He's not important enough to bring in for the feast. He's definitely not important enough for you to even take a look at. So here we finally get him called, and that's all we see is David, son of, son of Jesse, of Bethlehem. That's it. Bethlehem, is, uh, throughout pretty much all of Israel's history, Bethlehem has been a very small and important place. So here we have, you know, the family, basically, Saul has him beat. Um, but, and I do want to emphasize this, God can still use anyone from any family or status. The point of, of 1 Samuel is not, hey, if you've got a good family and you've got, you know, all this, all this different spiritual thing going on, God can't use you. That's not the point. The point is that man looks at the, at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. That's the whole point. Okay? So can God use someone who physically has it, has it going on? He's taller than everybody, smarter, uh, more attractive, has a better family. Yes, he can use that person too. Absolutely. But the problem is who we are looking at. When we look at somebody and see, oh, they're the perfect person, or oh, that person is not worth my time. So then we move forward in the story, and look how, look how they're introduced, okay? One day, this is verse 3 of chapter 9, one day the donkeys of Saul's father, Kish, wandered off. Just wandering off, okay? Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go look for the donkeys. So then the, the story goes on with this long, slow plod. If it's a fantasy book, this is the chapter you'd stop reading it at. He just, he's going off wandering looking for these donkeys, and that's it. It's like, wow, this is boring. Can we move on to something? And then you see how David is introduced. Let's look at this. Samuel asked him, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, he answered. This is David's father answering. But right now he's tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. See, the dad didn't have any qualms of sitting down to eat without him getting there. You see that? Then Saul dispatched messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So this is later in the story when, he has, when he's getting his promotion. The king finds out that David's actually really good at playing music. So he's like, hey, send this guy to me. And then you think, okay, so now that he's done that, uh, he's too important for the little ta- jobs now. But look. Send me your son who is with the sheep. He's still out there with the sheep. Do you see David out there trying to search for the sheep that wandered off? No, because he was with them the whole time. Meanwhile, Saul's introduction story is him bumbling through the hillside looking for his father's lost animals because he wasn't watching them in the first place. So you move on forward in the story and you think, okay, but surely by the time that we're, the story that we're reading about with David and Goliath, surely by that time that job is too small for him now. Because he's servicing the king at this point. Well, let's look at chapter 17, verse 20. It says, So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it. He's been promoted. He's getting to be a bit of a hot shot, and he's still out there making sure that those sheep are taken care of. Left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. So we see a very interesting thing happen here. He entrusted the sheep to a keeper before he left. See, Saul went searching for his lost animals, but David was diligent. He never lost them. You see a big contrast here in the story. And and Saul's introduction of bumbling through the hillside is even more striking when you read the whole book in one sitting and you see David enter, and he's not doing that. David was diligent. David was faithful in a little. And here's the thing about God. God looks for those who are faithful in little things to promote them to bigger things. We want God to give us something big. And God wants us to prove ourselves faithful in something small. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, if we just stop and th- that, that makes sense, right? Like, when, when, you, when you have kids, you didn't just, like, buy them a car and here you go. Or hope, I hope you didn't. Uh, the, you know, they prove themselves in smaller things and you kind of work up to a car, right? 
let's see how you do in driver's end, and then we'll talk about the car, right? Uh, I hope that's what you did. That's what my dad did, and I'm very thankful that he did uh, because I learned how to work for things. I, re- I, wanted this, I was really good at uh, classical guitar, and I really wanted this uh, guitar. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the guitar maker. They're kind of a big deal. They're called Pimentel. Uh, they're based in Albuquerque probably haven't heard of them. You're not guitar players. You, why would you care? But uh, I really wanted a, a guitar made by Pimentel. Uh, and so my dad said, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I can give you more, more hours to, to work at uh, construction, which if you know construction, it's not, not an easy job to have. <laughs> so I worked and I worked and I worked, and then I bought that guitar with my own money. It is my prized possession. Well, one of my prized possessions. Uh, <laughs> And it was actually one of the last ones made by Hector Pimentel before he died. He signed it, and then he died a couple months later. And I was like, oh, lucky timing on that one, huh? But as though, yes, David was faithful in little things, but here's the thing. That's not what made him a man with a heart after God. He was faithful in little things, but that's not what made him a man with a heart after God. David had direction in life. He knew what he was doing. He knew why he was doing it. And Saul really lacked that. But that's also not what made him a man with a heart after God. Let's look forward and see if maybe we can find some other answers. Let's look at the way that they're both anointed as king, right? And chapter 10 is Saul's anointing. Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, Hasn't the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully on you, Okay, you will prophesy with them, and here's the part I want you to pay attention to, and you will be transformed. Other translations say, and you will be changed. Well, so you would expect something similar in King David's anointing. Let's, let's move forward. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Okay, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David, still that same thing. The, the Lord came powerfully, okay, from that day forward. And moving on, then Samuel sent out and went to Ramah. It never says that it changed David. Very interesting. The wording is very similar, except we get to the point where it says, you will be changed, and David is not changed from the Holy Spirit. So this is my point in saying this. Yes, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it changes you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what I'm getting at, though. My point being, see, Saul was a bit of a coward. But God equipped him for the job that he was doing with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what stopped Saul from hiding. David wasn't like that. The Holy Spirit came powerfully on him and moved in him, but it didn't have to change him. See, King Saul's character was so lacking that the Holy Spirit had to do a big work in him to get him in the right direction. David didn't need that. And we'll look at why. Because the reason why is exactly why David was, was a man with a heart after God. So let's move forward. In both, in both stories, it's the same spirit. In both stories, it says that it came powerfully. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that we can learn from this little thing here that God qualifies the called. Saul was not doomed to fail. If God calls you something, he'll qualify you for it. Right? I think we can definitely see that. But I think we'd be a little bit remiss if we just focus on David for this story. Because here's the thing, okay? We all want to be David. We all want to be a person with a heart after God. And we all wanna, always want to be, you know, that guy, right? But oftentimes we find ourselves and oftentimes we think of ourselves as Saul. And so it's important for us to consider Saul because eventually we all come to those rock bottom points and we say, you never should have picked me in the first place, God. I'll never do it right. I just can't figure this out. We all hit those points. And when we hit those points, it's, it's easier if we look at Saul than if we look at David because sometimes David seems a little bit out of reach. So David is growing. We definitely see that. Saul is not. But that's not what made him a man after God's heart either. And there's other surface things that we aren't really going to look at too much. Like, for instance, it, Saul, was, when he was anointed, it says that he was a choice young man. 
He's this, this, this guy in, this, in his strength. He's still an adult, whereas David is introduced as more of a youth. So there's more surface things like that. But uh, let's move on to their character contrasted in the book. And for that, we go up once again to chapter 10. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't read uh, verse 14. Now, the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and an evil spirit sent from the Lord began to torment him. So we see the contrast made more uh, explicit there. Uh, now going on to chapter 10, we see their, con- their character contrasted. In, in chapter 10, verse 22, it, they're getting ready, ready to publicly acknowledge Saul as king. And this is what happens. They again inquired of the Lord, has the man come here yet? The Lord replied, there he is, hidden among the supplies. So imagine this scene, okay? All of Israel has gathered together to anoint this guy, okay? And over here, let's say we have a bunch of baggage, a bunch of stuff stacked over here. And everyone's looking around, well, where is he? It's just how comical Saul comes into the story. And God says, oh, there he is. Behind the baggage. Ah. Just how, how funny this scene plays out. They ran over and got him from there. <laughs> when he stood among the people, he stood ahead Taller than anyone else. So here's this sheepish guy that's taller than everybody else (laughs) hiding behind (laughs) the luggage. (laughs) You're not finding the humor in this? I'm I'm greatly enjoying this story. Uh, You guys, has anybody here ever had or had a friend who had a Great Dane? You guys ever seen these? Yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, These animals, they're huge. You could probably ride them like a horse, I could imagine, if you put a, (laughs) put a, what are they called, you know, the... A saddle, yeah. If you could put a saddle on it, you could probably ride the thing. And uh, uh, you, you have this human Great Dane. Because Great Danes don't know that they're big. They actually think that they're puppies. So they jump on you and they're all, let's play, let's play. Hiding behind when there's lightning, they're all freaking out. This is Saul. He's the human Great Dane. Here he is in front of all these people. He's like, oh, it ain't me, Lord. No, no, no. It ain't me you're looking for. <laughs> No, no Johnny Cash fans? Come on, guys, come on. Uh, so here he's hiding himself. Now let's look at King David, or David before he's king. In chapter 7, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the Philistine that was assaulting all of Israel, the one that was keeping everybody in fear, yeah, he killed him. When he was finished killing him, he, he comes, okay, so Abner, who's one of Saul's leaders, took him and brought him in before Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Whoa, this just got, not, this is no longer G-rated, man. This guy, this guy comes in here moving the rating up to R. And he's all, boom. Instead of dropping the mic, he's dropping the head on Saul's carpet. Like, it doesn't get more gangster than that. You might think that you're pretty hardcore, but are you hardcore dropping this Philistine's head on a king's floor? No, I don't think so. This guy, I mean, this is awesome. He, he's not hidden at all. He sees a problem, he goes out there and addresses the problem, and then he throws the problem at the king's fall, uh, feet, because honestly, the king should have taken care of it in the first place. Right? I mean, wasn't that the whole reason he was anointed king? He was a perfect fit for the position? Yeah, instead, he's cowering behind luggage. And here's David, boom, done. So then we move forward and we see this. Saul hid himself. David was hidden by man. You see the contrast between the two. See, nobody saw David's value. But everybody saw Saul's value. But Saul was hiding behind luggage. And David was killing giants. Let's move forward, because I think we're getting closer here. We're, We're definitely getting closer. And I don't want you to get the idea that David is this perfect specimen. He's so good and so perfect, and none of us can even hope. No. He actually makes, makes a long series of decisions. Everybody knows uh, his poor decision with the whole affair, killing his best friend, sleeping with Bathsheba, that whole thing. But there were other things that he did wrong, too. Okay, there, There's a long list. We're not going to go through that because it's not really relevant for what I'm talking about. His mistakes weren't what made him a man after God's heart. Okay, so as we go forward, let's look at the way that Saul responds to his... I'm sorry, David responds to his sin. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's it. No excuse, nothing. The prophet comes and says, hey, there's this guy that ripped off this other guy. And he says, 
he will die. And then and the prophet says, it was you. And there's no pretension, he just says. I've sinned. And it sounds like a cop-out because he says, I've sinned against the Lord. But it's not a cop-out. Because what he's saying is, the sin that I did wasn't merely against this woman or her husband or my friend. The sin that I did was against God himself. See, it's not a cop-out for David. He actually admits to more. He's appealing to the very highest authority. My sin was the greatest now let's look at how Saul deals with, deals with the sin. God tells him to go and, and fight these people, the Amalekites. And uh, we're going to look at that in just a minute. Uh, he goes, and then he does not obey. And does not do what the Lord says. And so he comes back, and Samuel says, Why haven't you obeyed? And this is where the story picks up in verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agag of of Amalek, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. I did it. But he was actually told not to bring anything back. He was actually told to wipe it all out. So he didn't. And then we hop forward, and Samuel says, Oh, but you didn't. You didn't, though. And so Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command. Oh, he's going to, this is going to be the time, right? No. And your words, because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. He still has not admitted to his problem. He's throwing somebody else under the bus. You remember in the book of uh, Exodus, yes, Exodus, about, I don't know, maybe around chapter 30 somewhere, I guess. Uh, Somewhere in there. Doesn't matter. Somewhere in there. Go back and read it, okay? Uh, Somewhere in the book of Exodus, uh, it says that Aaron took the people's jewelry and made a golden calf and they worshipped it. And when Moses is addressing Aaron about it, he says this, it was the darndest thing. I just, I threw the jewelry in and out pops this calf. It was the darndest thing. But it was these people, they put me up to it. They put me up to it. Exactly what we're hearing here. It's not really my fault. But you think, okay, well, that's good enough, right? Nope. Uh, now, therefore, please forgive my sin and return with me so I can worship the Lord. That you'd think, okay, well, that's, that's good enough, right? No. Then Samuel says, this is the time when God would have fermented, so it solidified your kingship. And then he starts to walk away, and he tries to, he, Saul tries to force Samuel to come back with him. He tries to grab at him, not let him go. Well, his, his, his robe ends up tearing. Ends up tearing. And then he turns back to him, the man who just tried to, tried to lay a hand on the prophet, and he says, in the same way, God has ripped it from ripped the kingdom from your hands, and then he goes to, and goes to leave. And Saul says, "This I have sinned." He figured it out. Please honor me now before the elders of of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so I can bow and worship to the Lord your God. And you think he was very very obviously absorbed with the appearance and with people's opinions. Absolutely, don't forget that people's opinions will always be a snare for you. But he finally admits the problem, and we're all thinking the same thing. He admitted the problem when he said, I have sinned, instead of throwing somebody else under the bus, right? Isn't that the way the story looks? It looks like, okay, well, now that he's admitted I have sinned, that's when he finally took ownership for his sin. But no, 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 no. The the part where he finally admitted to the problem is actually at the end of the verse. I'll read it again, because I didn't catch this the first time I read this. Come back with me so I can bow and worship to the Lord your God. Now, Saul has finally come to grips with his problem. Yahweh was not his God. Do you know what was his God? The same God we see him worshiping time and time again throughout the story. Not God, not Yahweh, but the opinions of of others. Saul constantly chased what other people thought of him, and that was his God. And it dictated everything that he did. Read through the stories with with Saul and look at how he's constantly trying to get the, the approval of others. Constantly. 
from the point of him hiding behind baggage because he's not good enough for them, all the way up to the point where he, uh, where he doesn't follow God's command here in chapter 15. So let's, let's keep going here. We have almost discovered, almost discovered what made David a man after God's heart. Let's move forward. Samuel also con- uh, contrasts their confidence. And in chapter 921, we see Saul responded, Am I not the, a Benjaminite from the smallest of Israel's tribes? Israel's tribes, and isn't my clan the least important of all the clans of the Benjaminite tribe? So why have you said something like this to me? Do you know who that mattered to? Him. It mattered to him. You know how you can tell it mattered to him? Because he's the one who brought it up. Nobody else brought up his lineage. Nobody else. But they also didn't bring up David's lineage. See, he was prideful, and his prideful made him, and pride, pride made him insecure. So now we look at David on, in the contrast to, to Saul. And we see Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man, the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem? That's who I am. He knows who he is. There's no hem hawing around. He knows. I'm the son of your servant. This is who I am. David faced challenges. Look at, let's see how David faces challenges. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that you should defy the armies of the living God? Who is he? Look at him trying to stir up the troops. It doesn't work. He has to do it and go and do it himself. But he tried to stir up the troops. He tried to. He keeps asking the same question over and over again, trying to get people riled up. They just, they're too scared though. Well, let's look at, let's look at Saul. Chapter 11, when Saul heard these words, he hears that something bad's about to happen, the Spirit of God suddenly came powerfully on him. See, it wasn't something that he wanted to do. The Holy Spirit had to move him to do it. And his anger burned furiously. In the account of David, do we see David's anger burning furiously? No. In the account of David, do we see him having to be moved to the Holy Spirit to go out and fight Goliath? No. No. What you do see is you see him saying, this guy, this guy is not stronger than our God. Let's deal with it. And then he goes out and deals with it. Meanwhile, you have Saul hiding in his tent. The only reason why Saul was able to face the, pro- face, face the problem in chapter 11 is just because the Holy Spirit moved him to. This guy had zero character. Now, so what are we left with? Or is there just some kind of long series of, of do's and don'ts as to this is all the things you have to do right to be a man after God's own heart, and these are all the things you shouldn't do to be a man after God's own heart? Or is it something that you're just born with? Some people are just born lucky, and they just have it all together, and that's David was just born with all the cards in his hand, and he's able to have the in with God, and Saul just didn't have that. No. No on both accounts. Was it an issue of charisma? And confidence that David was just had it going on, man. He's just a hit with the ladies. He's the most likely to succeed. He gets A's in high school. I mean, this guy's got it going on. Meanwhile, Saul was a college dropout or something. I don't know. And no, no, no on that either. There are basically two major events for Saul that disqualified him. He did other stupid things, but these are the two foundational, pivotal moments in his life. Chapter 13, verse 5 says, The Philistines also gathered to fight against Israel 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They didn't even, weren't even able to count them for the book. They don't even count them. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Even Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan uh, to the land uh, of Gad and Gilead. They're, they're moving out of Dodge. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal, and all his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set, but Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, Well, I'm going to lose all my ability to fight this massive force. Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. It sounds like this is not a big deal. It sounds like he's being a wise leader, doesn't it? I mean, honestly, you know the way that the story ends, but pretend you don't know the way the story ends. It sounds like he's being a good leader. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Boy, oh boy. Have you ever done that as a kid? You're doing something stupid, and then right as you do it, your parents walk in, and you're like, oh, man. So close. So Saul went out to greet him. When uh, when the Philistines heard, I'm sorry, let me stop there. We're going to stop there. So this, the, taken by itself, you're like, okay, what's the issue? What really is the problem? But if you, 
read just a couple chapters earlier, you'll remember this very interesting story where almost the exact same thing happens. Chapter 7 says, When the Philistines heard that the Israelites had gathered at Mizpah, their rulers marched up toward Israel. When the Israelites heard about it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? It's almost like the story we just read. Then Samuel took a young lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Okay, so you still have Samuel offering a sacrifice. The only thing is Saul took that from Samuel instead. He cried out to the Lord on behalf of Israel, and the Lord answered him. Samuel was offering the burnt offering as the Philistines approached to fight against Israel. Are you seeing the contrast here? Saul is offering as Samuel walks up. Samuel is offering as the Philistines walk up. Philistines are the ones attacking in both stories. It's an overwhelming odd that they cannot beat in both stories. So Saul, basically Saul has something to reference back to. You know, sometimes when God asks you to step out a big step of faith and you don't have anything to lean back on, oh, I, can, I know I can get through this because God did that one time. Well, Saul had that. He could have just looked back to what happened before, but he doesn't. Let's keep going. The Lord thundered loudly against the Philistines that day and threw them into such confusion that they were defeated by Israel. Then the men of Israel charged out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, striking them down all the way to a place below beth which is a bit of a ways. So here we have Saul taking it into his own hands without trusting God, and then he has excuses. In the story, Saul explains it like this. Samuel, you don't understand. It was out of my hands. I, I forced myself to make, the, uh, to make the sacrifice. I forced myself to do it. No, 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 no. See, Saul's still offering the same excuses. Why should he doubt what God has done before? Why should he doubt? But still, that really hasn't resolved the issue. What was the issue? What's, what sin did Saul actually commit? It wasn't wrong for Saul, Saul to, to offer a sacrifice. So what really was the sin that he did? Well, you have that he didn't trust God. Yeah, but that's not the problem. I mean, it is a problem, but it's not the problem. Uh, he wasn't waiting on God. Yes, that's true. But that's not really the problem either. It wasn't his job to offer the sacrifice. It was Samuel's. Well, absolutely. But that was not the problem either. The problem, which Samuel makes abundantly clear, is that he didn't obey. If you have your Bible, you can read it right now in verse 13. He says, if, did, I, did I put it on the screen? No, I did not. He says, you have disobeyed the Lord. You have disobeyed his commandment. See, we all thought that it was something to do with the sacrifice, didn't we? It had to be that maybe he just didn't offer it right or something, right? I mean, was I the only person thinking that? Well, then we read further in the account and Samuel clarifies it was because of disobedience. That was the root problem disobedience. Well, so that's not the only thing that happens. You go to chapter 15. This is the second of those two big things that, that Saul does that takes him off as king. Now, go and attack the Malachites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. Wow, that's quite a bit to take in. He captured King Agag of Amalek alive, but he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul, see, he didn't have a problem killing the babies. He had a problem killing the king with the power. It's a bit of a statement, right? I mean, he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. Now, I know what Robert's thinking. I got my eye, right? <laughs> A joke from men's conference. Uh, they were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. So you think there that, okay, because Saul even says, he even says, look, I, I did what you asked. I, I, ki I, I obeyed. I killed them. I remember how we read that verse. Well, now let's look at the, the very last. Well, not the very last. I think there's 31 chapters. Towards the end of First Samuel, one of the last chapters, it says this in chapter 30. David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag. Wait, I thought he killed them all, didn't he? Didn't we just read how he killed them all? Didn't we? See, the Bible sometimes does this thing where it records sarcasm. 
So this is basically, I'm going to add my tone to the Bible, okay? Yeah, he totally killed the Amal- Amalekites. He totally did that. Definitely. Definitely did that. Oh, by the way, the Amalekites also burned uh, David's city of Ziklag. He has the sarcastic statement. He did not do that. The author didn't suddenly have some kind of a, a fit and forgot what happened earlier in the story when he was writing for Samuel. He knew what happened. He's writing it as a, as a way of being a dramatic irony, if you will. So in both cases, you see that uh, there's a sacrifice involved. In, in, the, in chapter 13, Saul's offering the sacrifice. In chapter 2, he wants to offer a sacrifice. But the sacrifice isn't the main issue that's being addressed in both stories. You see, in both stories, the issue was Saul didn't obey. He has a listening problem. Have you ever had a kid who had a listening problem? You, just, you tell them and they don't do it. You tell them again, they don't do it. It's like, okay, well, this is getting a little bit monotonous. I think, I, I think you are aware of what's going on and do the thing that I told you to do. And that's, that's Saul. That, that's definitely Saul. Uh, he's repeatedly disobeying. He always has excuses. And he has these ulterior motives where he's disobeying because he has a reason for disobeying. The people wouldn't have been happy with me. I had to do this because the people wouldn't have been happy with me. I had to do this because the people always worshiping his God. Saul was infirm and he compromised. We see that in both chapter 13 and verse in chapter 15. Uh, and the reason, going back to chapter 17, the, the, I know you guys probably all forgot by now, but we actually started on 17 with the story of David and Goliath. Uh, Saul couldn't face the Philistines because he didn't obey in chapter 13 and chapter 15. Why, we asked a question at the beginning. We said, why? What happened? How did we get here? How, why is Saul cowering in his tent instead of out there? This is the thing he was made for. Because he didn't obey in chapter 13 and 15, he wasn't able to obey in chapter 17. See, the Holy Spirit didn't move him powerfully this time. There comes a point when you can go to as many services as you want and shake all you want. But if you're not willing to obey and forgive and move forward, you can't just keep expecting the Holy Spirit to do all the work for you. There has to be a point when you bring your heart. And Saul never reached that point, before he was king or after. And if you read in 1 Chronicles 10, 13, which um, we read uh, sometime last month, I want to say, the end of April, I want to say, maybe the beginning of May, somewhere around there, we read this verse. Saul died for his unfaithfulness to the Lord because he did not keep the Lord's word. He even consulted a medium for guidance, or a a spiritist, a a seer. So in some translations, it says like this. He was also killed for consulting the medium, depending on what what translation you have. So he was killed for consulting the medium? Is that that what's going on? That's why he wasn't king? But here's the thing. The whole reason why he consulted the medium was because God wouldn't answer him. Look at chapter 28, for instance. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. So he had no choice. But the reason God wouldn't answer him was because of, unfa- because of his unfaithfulness. We see that from 1 Chronicles 10, 13. You see, his unfaithfulness was the two big things in chapter 13 and 15 where he disobeyed. And it was also he slaughtered the priests of God. Oh, I want to hear from you, God. Of course, I'm going to kill your priests. Uh, <laughs> He, he, there was a lot of different things he was doing, and I, I'm not going to go through each every single one of them, but uh, long story short, he wasn't seeking God. So let's go back to the story that we started in with the Philistines. David could face the Philistines, but Saul was too scared. Why? Why was David able to do this thing and Saul was not? More, after David put himself out to fight the Philistines, he was then able to fight the Amalekites in chapter 30, and he won over them. But Saul wouldn't fight the Amalekites. So something he couldn't do and something he wouldn't do. Why? These are very important questions to ask, and I think that we have an answer. And I think that the answer leads us towards what made David a man after God's heart. So let's kind of recap here. Yes, David was faithful and little, and so and he trusted God. Yes, absolutely. We can go through stories very quickly. Let's just look at this. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What would be done for the man who kills that Philistine? We read that verse earlier. And then in in chapter 23, so David inquired of the Lord. See, he inquired of the Lord, should I launch an attack against the Philistines? And then you hop down to um, to verse 3, and it says, but David's men said to him, look, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Calais against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, go at once to Calais. 
And then we get to chapter 24. He said to his men, as the Lord is my witness, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. He, I would never kill Saul. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. So you see here David's character. You see the way that he's faithful and little. You see the way that he's trusting God at every turn. But there's actually something bigger, bigger that David did. This is what made him a man after God's own heart. Are you ready? We're going to have the big reveal. We've been building it all service for two weeks now. Here we go. Uh, where was that? No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. He worshipped God from his youth. See, David get, made God a priority from his youth. Let's look, for instance, at chapter 16. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is also a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. See, David was out there singing his worship songs long before he was a king. For David, it wasn't about a position. For Saul, it was. And that's how we do, isn't it? When there's a lack of God's word in our life, we try to substitute with positions. Didn't we look at that last, last week? I may not hear from God, but I'm going to get a strong position. I may be appointed by people. People are going to look up to me. See, it's, it's not, I asked a bit of a trick question before. I said, what, would David, what was David going to do with his life that would make him that? But that's not, not accurate. See, it wasn't something he was going to do. It was something he already was. David already was a man after God's heart when he was anointed. So what made the decision in all David's, what made the, the difference in all David's decisions? That he already was a man after God's own heart. He's already there. Saul was not. And then when he became king, he did not do anything to fix the problem. He didn't ever strengthen that with God. You don't see him having devotionals. Now, God doesn't expect perfection. He expects obedience. And obedience comes from a heart for God. Obedience does not come from strength. Saul didn't own up. He didn't fix it. He didn't rep repent because he didn't cultivate a heart after God. He didn't seek after God. Because he didn't cultivate that servant worship heart, he didn't have it when the time was needed. See, so most of us go through the same process. I'll read my Bible when I have more time. I'll pray when I have more time. When I get to that big situation in my life, then I'll seek God. But all that that does is it ensures we do not have the strength and the purpose to do the thing that God has called us to when we get there. And then God's anointing falls on deaf ears. But if you prepare now, it doesn't matter how small the thing is God brings you to. You'll do it well because you've cultivated your heart and it's become a heart after God. See, Saul didn't own up, but David, David admitted he trusted God, he obeyed, he stepped out in faith, all these wonderful things because he had cultivated a heart for God. Before the battle with the Philistines that we read about in chapter 17, before Goliath, before the Amalekites, there was worship for David. Before the battle ever came, for David, there was worship. Don't wait until the battle comes. Worship now while you still have time and cultivate your heart because it's much like planting a seed. Has anybody here ever done any garden work or plant, grown trees or anything? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you have to baby it at first, don't you? you? The soil has to be right. You have to make sure the right stuff's in it. Then you plant your seed. Once it grows, you don't just leave it alone. You've got to baby the thing. You're always out there every day making sure it's growing good. We have Walmart, but back in the day, they didn't. And so if they didn't do a good job babying that seed, it'd be dead, and they would die. This is something they kind of had to do. Well, it's the exact same thing here. Saul didn't understand that he was going to die if he didn't cultivate his heart for God. And David did understand that. Because going to McDonald's isn't going to strengthen our faith. Reading a Christian book isn't going to sustain us. Watching worship videos every once in a while isn't going to sustain us. Going to Sunday church isn't going to sustain us. We have to cultivate a heart in us for God. That comes as we seek, as we seek. The reason why David was able to admit to the sin, trust God, obey, stepping out in faith is because he cultivated his heart. Before the battle, he cultivated his heart. In all things, David's heart was set on God. He was a man after God. In all things, his heart was set on God. He had a singular purpose, a singular drive. And not only was David faithful and little, he was according to God's heart, God's heart because 
I'm sorry, before God appointed him. Before God appointed him, he was there. Saul, on the other hand, didn't have confidence to face the battles. Not because he failed. Not because he was destined to fail. Not because, uh, you know, God was just done with him and he just had too many chances. Remember, I brought up last week, God didn't throw him away. He, he threw, threw him away from leadership. He still could have came to God. That's not what we're even talking about. But he failed, and he, was, and he wasn't destined to fail. It was because he didn't cultivate his heart for God. See, and a man according to God's heart has desire for God, has passion for God. And here's the thing, okay? Remember this. Passion for God, the desire for God, qualifies you and promotes you. Now, I'm not saying you can earn your salvation. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about appointment. Those are two different things. You cannot earn your salvation. Okay, I'm not, not preaching that. But when God has an appointment for you, a purpose for your life, if you cultivate your heart, that will qualify you for your appointment. It doesn't matter if you mess up. It doesn't matter if you don't do it perfectly well. It does not matter. Mistakes happen. Oh, well. Like, I've messed up so many times since I've come here. The board's messed up on stuff. The staff has messed up on stuff. It's fine. People make mistakes. It's not a huge deal. You fix it, you grow, you learn, you move on, right? I mean, isn't that what you do when, when you're parenting? We all think that we know what we're doing. We have no idea what we're doing. We've got these kids and we're trying our best, but then we're like, wow, that was a stupid thing I did there. And uh, then we learn and we do better. And then by the time that they have kids, we know how to tell them how to be better parents. That's a joke, okay? It's a joke. Gee whiz. Uh, anyways, uh, but when you, when, you, uh, when you seek after God, he, that qualifies you and promotes you for what God has appointed you to. And we're getting ready to go to prayer here. If you want God to do big things in your life, you're looking for God to do big things in your life, you want to succeed in your ministry, you want to succeed in your work, you want to love and serve Roswell, you want to have, have an impact on people, you want a strong, healthy marriage, cultivate a heart after God. You want victory in your life, cultivate a heart after God. And why I'm using that word cultivate is because when you plant something, it's not easy work. Growing things is hard. You have to work the soil, loosen it up, get the weeds out, make sure it's all fertilized, and then you plant the seed, and then you grow it, and you baby it, and move on, right? It's the same thing with our faith. We have to cultivate it. It's a slow, arduous thing. And if you're not making time for God in your life, it's going to be hard, really hard to grow a seed there. Don't worry, the heat that you're feeling uh, is not the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, judging you or anything. Uh, it's the fact that I didn't turn on the AC before. I'm sorry. <laughs> La- last week that that happens, I swear. Uh, if you join me in prayer, let's, let's go to prayer. If you need prayer for anything whatsoever, any th- prayer for anything at all, please come to the front. And also, while those people are coming to the front, as we seek... God, answer us tenfold. Lord, that as we bring our hearts to you, that you would surpass our expectations. So as, as we're all coming up for prayer, if you are at a point when you realize, yeah, you know, I just really need to get closer to God, come up with everybody else too. If you need prayer for anything at all, you need healing, you just need a good touch in your life, you need uh, direction, anything at all, come up to the front. We're going to pray for you. I'll give you just a minute. Don't want to make anybody feel uh, like there. people are looking around. If you close your eyes and, and, and bow your head so nobody feels like they're on, on point here. If you need prayer for anything, come on up. We're going to pray for you. But also, if you just need to get closer to God, come up to the front. doesn't matter if you've messed up before. God's not done with you. God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. 